us today. You're tuned in to the launch event for Waste Not, Want Not, an initiative of the Center for Biosecurity Studies at the University of the West Indies Cape Hill campus in Barbados. My name is Christiane Walcott. I'm the operations manager here at the center and I'm pleased to be opening today's online proceedings. As always, I take this opportunity to particularly acknowledge colleagues and students from around the Cape Hill campus and the wider UWI community. Distinguished members of the advisory committee of the Center for Biosecurity Studies who may be joining us later. And of course, today's feature presenters, Professor Winston Moore, Professor of Economics and Deputy Principal of the UWI Cave Hill Campus. Dr. Legina Henry, Lecturer in Renewable Energy, who's based in the UE Cave Hills Department of Computer Science, Mathematics and Physics in the Faculty of Science and Technology. Dr. Nikolai Holder, also hailing from, the, from Cave Hills Faculty of Science and Technology, the Department of Biological and Chemical Sciences and key coordinator of the campus's bioenergy and biofuel research and development project. And Mrs. Shan Cuffey Young, founder and CEO of Soil and Environmental Services Limited in Trinidad and Tobago, a social enterprise working to transform the way we think about waste. We welcome you all, including those of you who are frequent followers of our quarterly lecture series, which was most recently held last Wednesday and where this event would have been first publicized. And we also welcome those of you who have responded to our subsequent circulars and other kinds of outreach about this webinar event. Today's panelists will be addressing the issue of merging biosecurity, sustainability, and the circular bioeconomy. Now, it's easy to get bogged down in all of the socioeconomic and environmental challenges that bedevil our region, from hurricanes and volcanoes to water scarcity to sargassum influx, to rising sea levels, to chronic non-communicable diseases, to COVID. The list is daunting and seemingly lengthening. And each of these can individually stymie the ability to attain national and regional development goals. Today's discussion will explore the views, ideas, and work of some of Cave Hill's own thought leaders in this space. And we will seek to take this discourse to a solutions-driven place. How are we harnessing the resources that we do have to, engin to engender positive results and impacts for communities and societies? And to do so not only in sustainable ways, but equally importantly, in financially viable ways to genuinely improve quality of life and build livelihoods for our people. We have quite a full lineup for you today, as you would have heard, and our four distinguished panelists who will be joining us shortly the center's director, Dr. Kurt Douglas, will join us as well to chair that portion of the program and, of course, furnish us with more fulsome introductions for each of our presenters. For now, as we get underway, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is on double duty of sorts today. Professor Winston Moore is substantively a professor of economics, currently serving as the deputy principal of the Cave Hill campus. As one of today's featured speakers, we will later be hearing from Professor Moore as he engages with the panel. However, at this time, I invite him to bring opening remarks in his more global capacity as Deputy Principal of the Cave Hill Campus. Professor Moore. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, fellow panelists, especially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to bring welcome remarks on behalf of the management and staff of the UWI Cave Hill Campus. You know, one of the fundamental roles of any university is to be a thought leader for its community. As a community of scholars, we do this by engaging our community on issues that are of interest to them and bringing our skills as researchers to analyze these problems. On that note, I would therefore like to congratulate the head of the Center for Biosecurity Studies, Dr. Kurt Douglas, and his colleagues for organizing this event. You have put together a great group of individuals pushing the frontiers of their field. And you've also added an economist to the list as well. So congrats. Today's topic, merging biosecurity, sustainability and circular bioeconomy is one of significant importance to Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean. As a member of the Partnership for Action on the Green Economy, PH, the island has put forward a bold vision for recovery based on the green and blue economy. The PAGE Inception Report for Barbados notes that PAGE will focus on boosting the circular economy 
and promoting greener consumption and pr production practices. This seminar therefore fits nicely into the policy agenda for the island. Over the last five years, the campus has definitely lived by the mantra of waste not want not. Since 2016-17, the campus has reduced its expenditure by 26%, an average of about 5% per year. One of the ways we have been able to reduce costs is through the use of renewable energy. Through the, through the Renewable Energy Committee, chaired by the campus bursar, we have been able to secure grants to install solar photovoltaic systems across the campus and install energy saving bulbs in high use areas. This has resulted in cost savings in re relation to electricity. And we expect to see similar savings in the coming academic year to meet our cost cutting ambitions. In fact, in one building, we are saving approximately $100,000 per month just with those innovations that I have listed earlier. The main driver of any modern university is its faculty of science and technology. Our faculty, however, has not seen any new investment since the 1960s. We therefore commissioned a project to plan the revitalization effort in the faculty of science and technology, which definitely is closely related to today's thematic area. In addition to the program and curriculum renewal, the report also recommended a formal the formation of a commercial analytical lab as a means of generating revenue for the faculty. We've had discussions with clients and we are therefore in the final stages of this product. When complete, the project will offer a wide range of pharmacological testing services to firms in Barbados and throughout the Caribbean. This is just one of the innovative projects we have planned to support income generation for the Faculty of Science and Technology and also to help local com companies. I'm also looking forward to the very interesting presentations by today's panelists, who I know will outline their vision for the circular economy and also help the campus to formulate its vision for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and do enjoy the remainder of the seminar. Thank you, Deputy Principal. And we very much look forward to hearing your substantive panel presentation in a few minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, as we now move into the main event for today, the panel presentations and discussion, we will open this portion of the program by administering the first of two short polls, which should be coming up on your screens shortly. And while you do so, I take this opportunity to now welcome the Director of the Center for Biosecurity Studies, Dr. Kurt Douglas, who will give you some additional detail about today's polls, how we will be using this data, and to get today's presentations underway. Director, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Christian. And a good warm welcome to all of you from wherever you may be in the world. Thank you for uh, joining us here at CBS and the launch of our we is not want not initiative. Uh, you'll see the poll here. We just want to collect some information from you, the attendees. Um, so this will help to build out our um, engagement um, with the public and also our courses as well that we have planned in the future. And so now I will just explain a bit more about what this initiative is about um, so we can provide some context um, as we go forward. So. Let me start the presentation. And what is this Waste Not Want Not initiative? As you would have heard, it's the merging of biosecurity, sustainability, and the circular bioeconomy. And we have a number of goals and objectives that we are interested in. Um, the first of which is to establish alternative pathways for waste streams and wasted opportunities that that, are, that we can then derive economic value and minimize pollution here in the Caribbean. We also want to maximize this bioeconomy potential through the utilization of native biodiversity that is so rich here in the Caribbean. And as a result, we are hoping to develop education and training courses and programs on Caribbean sustainability to utilize the bioeconomy to counter biosecurity threats here. And in doing so, we hope to establish CBS as a regional knowledge hub for the bioeconomy and sustainability. So what frames this initiative is a number of global, regional, and national policies. The first policy is the Barbados National Energy Policy, um, 2019 to 2030. And you'll hear a bit more of this from some of the presenters to come. And this is designed to achieve a 100% renewable energy 
and carbon neutrality uh, for Barbados by the year 2030. There's also the Clean and Green Barbados Initiative, which examines sustainability, um, beautification, and also protection of the environment. There's also the Bridgestone Declaration that was signed in Barbados virtually um, through the UNEP uh, for a meeting of ministers of environment from around the Caribbean and also in Latin America. And what they agreed to is a green and sustainable post-COVID-19 economic recovery that will yield resilience and improve our health ecosystems and environments. And the last one, which is perhaps the most well-known of these, is the Paris Climate Accord, um, where our national determined contributions aim to limit greenhouse gas emissions to uh, no more than a 1.5 degree Celsius rise by the year 2030. Now, there are a number of different challenges that we hope to address with this initiative. And one central one as highlighted here is the basis of our economy, um, use the utilization of fossil fuels and our heavy dependency on fossil fuels. There's also solid waste and liquid waste management, um, high health care costs with relation to NCDs, the rampant biodiversity decline, and also climate change and the necessary impacts. So we come now to the bioeconomy. What exactly is this bioeconomy? And what this actually entails is the biodiversity that is present within your particular region or country. So this would include plants and animals or even the microbiome and also your different waste streams. And this could be solid waste or liquid waste from a number of different sources, whether industrial or agricultural. And these are then converted through different processes into using certain technologies to produce viable products that can then generate economic activity and develop um, economic growth. So carbon dioxide, this is a major player within the climate change conversation. And what you see here is a simple carbon cycle. And what you see in the environment and in our air, we have carbon dioxide. We exhale carbon dioxide as we breathe and we breathe in oxygen. Trees are suited and adapted to utilize that carbon dioxide through a process called carbon sequestration. It's just a big word where it means the trees are utilizing the carbon dioxide from the air, pulling it in through photosynthesis with the leaves, converting that carbon dioxide into sugar and also into um, cellulose or lignin, which is wood. And as the tree dies or the leaves fall, then they become um, decomposed by bacteria and then release carbon dioxide back into the air. The issue here though, is that this is the normal natural process, but through our human activity, from the burning of fossil fuels and from other um, production, um, for instance, the production of cement, which is perhaps one of the most energy intensive products that we have on the market. And next to water, it is the most utilized commodity on earth. Um, you get an imbalance and there's, so there is an excess of carbon dioxide in the air and this is what is fueling global warming and also the climate change that we are um, experiencing throughout the world. So there are different methods to reduce the carbon dioxide in the air, one of which is carbon sinking. And this can, for example, be done where you actually sink this carbon into the built environment through uh, the use of cement. So rather than using water, you can actually convert um, the cement or uh, concrete, to, well, produce concrete rather from cement, utilizing um, carbon dioxide instead of water. And this can reduce the cost of building and also the time for completion of building as well. There's also the utilization of carbon dioxide as a green solvent, utilizing both plant biodiversity, uh, marine biodiversity, and also terrestrial fauna such as African green monkeys to produce value added products. And this is just a quick breakdown of some of the product streams that you can have generated. The, the most primary one, which will be dealt with specifically in this webinar, the green and renewable energy products. There's also cosmeceuticals, fragrances and flavors, food and beverages, uh, bioplastics and, and pharmaceuticals. And, 
all the, the other interesting products. So I'll take a moment just to highlight this particular product because this is really the focus of this particular um, webinar. Um, the issue of the economy being based on fossil fuels and the dependency on fossil fuels is a major hindrance, not only for the Caribbean, but several other countries. And so what we're looking at is the production and the use of green and renewable fuels so that we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that we have um, for Barbados and also the rest of the Caribbean. And the two products that we will be focusing on are um, biogas and biodiesel. So what is really needed for this initiative? So we have to understand the issue of waste, not only in Barbados, but across the Caribbean. We need to understand what is there and exactly how much is there. And we also have to look at the different waste problems that the persons in the manufacturing sectors, also the agro-processing sectors that they face so that we can help them um, meet those specific needs. We also have to look at the use of plastics, these petroleum derived plastics, and how we could potentially replace them with bioplastics. And so we will be actively looking for um, funding to support this work. And we'll also be looking to help with the research and development needs of manufacturers, of agro-processors um, across the region and the nexus with the circular bioeconomy. So that's just a brief synopsis of the initiative. And we look forward to you joining us for the other um, panel events. But I will, with no further ado, um, introduce the next speaker who is Professor Winston Moore. And I will introduce him to give his presentation on the green economy, the green economy scope and study for Barbados. And um, I hope that you will enjoy today's proceedings. So over to you, Professor, Professor Moore. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. Um, I'm just bringing up my presentation now. Uh, hopefully that is fine. Everyone can see the presentation, correct? Yes, sir. Right, so um, Kirk, uh, sorry, I keep calling you um, Dr. Douglas, but I know you more often as, as Kirk, so I'll call you Kirk. One of sure, the things no that you mentioned in your presentation was the Bridgestone Declaration. And the Bridgestone Declaration spoke about the, um, the idea that countries are going to use the, uh, this, this notion of the green economy as a pathway to recover from COVID-19. So in, in putting together my presentation, what I have done is I've pulled out the recommendations from the green economy scope and study to see how we can use that, those recommendations as a, as a means towards stimulating growth within the Caribbean. So the, the scope and study is a, is a huge document. I encourage you to take a look. So, but what I've done today is just largely look at the recommendations in relation to greening and the investment gaps that we could potentially utilize in the region to stimulate growth. Uh, I, I want to start first by framing this, um, this notion of the green economy at, from a theoretical perspective and the way how economists look at this issue. Uh, traditionally, um, economists have always seen this, this divergence between the economy and ecology. Uh, so if you want to stimulate economic activity, it therefore results in, in greater economic deg degradation. So for example, the tourism sector or the tourism industry has a negative impact on the economy. Um, if you want to stimulate other, uh, say other uh, industries in your country, you have to pull in more, re more resources and those, those natural resources have an impact on your environment. Say for example, construction. So as, say, as construction increases, as you have a construction boom, it has this negative impact on the environment. Well, the, the way in which you can sort of formalize this and the way in which this has normally been formalized is, is through this so-called, uh, through a so-called environmental Kuznets curve. And the environmental Kuznets curve as illustrated here on this diagram, uh, 
conceptualize economies is going through three key phases. You have this pre-industrial phase where you're, you're largely focused on your agrarian types of economies. So you're, you're, you're focused on agriculture as the main route of, of stimulating economic activity and generating jobs. Uh, not too many societies fit into this, this, this phase too much now. Uh, because most economies have moved past that, um, that traditional um, pre-industrial economy phase. Um, the, the second phase that economists speak about when they speak about the stages of economic development is this so-called industrial economy phase. And the industrial economy phase is, is where, uh, where, where countries unfortunately or fortunately want to locate themselves. And, and the idea here is that you're, you're investing a lot in manufacturing, um, and you're investing a lot in, um, in technology to pull the economy out of that traditional pre-industrial phase. Um, and you, as a result, the, you have this sort of hump shaped relationship between economic growth and environment. So that as the, as the country or the, or the region goes through this industrial phase, uh, then you start utilizing more um, resources, more natural resources, yes, but then you start getting the benefits of efficiency and efficiency then starts to reduce your, your, your environmental footprint and reduces the impact on, on, the, on, on, your, um, on your environment. And then finally, you have this post-industrial phase and this is where a, a number of the Caribbean economies are, are located in this phase or if they're not located in this phase, they're transitioning to this phase where most of your economy is, uh, is based uh, around services. So Barbados, for example, uh, approximately 70% of economic activity is generated through the services, through the service industries. And one of the benefits of these service industries is that, yes, you have this um, lower use of natural resources, but these, this, this post-industrial phase is also characterized by high levels of economies of scale high levels of productivity and the benefits of economies of scale and the benefits of productivity is that you then utilize um, your resources or you're, you're more efficient at utilizing your natural resources. So this is the, the, the conceptual framework that economists use or the traditional lens that economists use to, to, to speak about the environment and the economy. Now there is, there's one big problem with this framework and the big problem with this framework is that it assumes that um, the, the damage caused in the industrial phase can be, can be solved or can be addressed as the economy moves through the service, um, through the post-industrial phase. So as I use up my, my natural resources, I can potentially um, you know, replant those mangroves. I can maybe, uh, get back those fish that would have um, died off in the industrial phase. And one of the, the things that science has taught us is that it's not always easy um, to, re to regain the, 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 the environmental damage or to recover from the environmental damage that we have done to our environment in this industrial phase. And this is therefore where the green economy concept comes in. And the green economy con concept therefore suggests that no, you don't have to have this, um, this divergence between the economy and the environment. You can actually have a, a, nice, a nice middle where you, by investing in green industries, you not only stimulate growth and generate green jobs, but you also provide um, a means of um, protecting your natural environment. And, and this is why the green economy concept has been so popular by these multinational agencies like UNEP and, and PAGE as well, because of the potential benefit of addressing key issues like unemployment. Within the Caribbean, unemployment in, in some islands is around 40%. Uh, in Barbados, as a result of COVID, um, unemployment unfortunately has gone up to around 40%, but before COVID, unemployment in Barbados used to be around, um, just around 10%. Or a little bit lower, depending on um, the phase and the business cycle that we were in. Um, so, 
Barbados, as a result of the potential benefits that we've seen, has set itself this, this very bold objective of being the greenest economy in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. And what I'm going to do in my next couple of minutes is just identify those areas that we can look at to stimulate growth uh, within Caribbean economies. The, the first area I want to mention is investment in green goods and green trade. Um, we, we don't really think a lot about, about greening and trade. Uh, we largely only think about this after the fact. Um, so for example, we might more focus on the fact that we're importing PV systems, uh, we're importing renewable energy e equipment. But uh, a number of Caribbean countries actually export um, pieces of their environment and export um, renewable and sorry, we export um, environmental or, or green goods as part of their natural uh, export product. And this is an area where we can actually see some potential growth. The estimate for Barbados, um, the estimate is unfortunately a little bit, uh, not just a little bit old, but is, is, is over 10 years old. And so the last estimate for green trade or green exports from Barbados put at $150 million. Um, and to put that number in context, um, our rum industry generates just around 70, $80 million uh, per year in exports. So if you're getting around $150 million from green exports, it means that you have a lot of potential here. If you invest in green exports, you can generate a significant amount of foreign exchange for Caribbean economies. And this is one of the areas that the green economy scope and study would have pointed out as an investment gap that we can look at. The other area that I wanted to, to look at as well is the, the green initiatives that firms are, are pursuing. And the, the green initiatives take a very um, broad definition of greening. So we looked at the areas that firms are, are trying to reduce their waste output. Um, firms are trying to reduce their usage of water. Uh, firms are obviously trying to reduce their use of, um, of energy. Um, and if you take this very broad definition, you can see that both manufacturing and service uh, firms within Barbados and the Caribbean, uh, because I've done similar work for the rest of the Caribbean as well, are actually investing in these green initiatives. So it therefore provides a really interesting way for firms to um, not only invest in ways to increase productivity, but also to help the economy itself reduce its uses of foreign exchange as well. So one of the things that we can do to stimulate growth um, within the Caribbean economies over the next couple of years is to see how we can encourage or we can facilitate um, firms in manufacturing and services industries to, to sort of incorporate more of these green initiatives in their investment um, portfolio. Um, the green economy scope and study focused on a number of key sectors and one of those sectors was transportation. And we would have spoken to um, key stakeholders across the transport um, sector looking at you know, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, uh, and what are the investment gaps. And there are a couple of things um, that were noted in terms of the investment gaps, and, and these are areas that we can therefore use to stimulate growth and development over the next couple of years. The first was public attitudes. And I'm, I'm sure Legina is gonna mention this in her presentation afterwards, but say for example, um, the public's knowledge of electric vehicles. Um, when we would have spoken to spoken to the public about um, electric vehicles, there was still uh, lots of um, uh, you know lots of very strange questions that we received from the public. So the public was asking us, you know, can we get parts for electric vehicles? Um, how long will the electric vehicle last? Um, these very basic first order questions, which means that there's a there's a significant investment gap in public information that we need to address over the next couple of years if we're going to green these Caribbean economies. The second area is the, is the issue of air pollution. Um, one of the things we don't do too well is to look at the, the amount of waste coming out of the tailpipes of our vehicles. We just know that we have a, a significant amount of vehicles on the road, but we don't know how much um, that what was the impact that is having on, on, on pollution and therefore air quality in, in our countries. Um, then the 
our stakeholders would have mentioned that they need some, some progress in the area of traffic congestion and also the, the whole notion of human resource capacity investment. Because if you're gonna get these, um, these more advanced vehicles coming in, um, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, we're gonna to need to invest more in education so that we have people to repair those vehicles as well. So these are the four investment gaps that were flagged by um, our key stakeholders and, and, and persons within transport as areas that we need to work on if we're going to green the transport sector. Um, they, they put forward a number of really interesting um, recommendations in, in relation to greening. The, the first one was on street parking charges. And the idea here is that we, in Barbados, we have persons parking uh, uh, on the streets all over the island. So if you can um, develop a system to collect um, on street parking charges, those revenues, those fees can then be used to then further green the transport sector. Uh, and that can actually be a, a fairly interesting way of financing the green transition. The stakeholders also mentioned the notion of integrated approach to public transport transportation, because as we move, if we can simply move um, Barbadians out of their private vehicles into public transport, that immediately has a, a, a positive impact on the use of uh, fossil fuels. And then uh, I'm not going to mention these other two areas because we have presenters um, speaking on these, but the, the green economy sc scoping study would have mentioned the, the benefits that could have been obtained through standard um, fuel mixes as well as electric vehicles as well. Um, I know my time limit is 10. Is, I know I just have 10 minutes, but so I'm going to wrap up very soon. Uh, tourism. Uh, there was also a, a lot of really great recommendations in, in relation to greening tourism. Uh, the key areas here that the policymakers and the stakeholders wanted us to look at was to see how we can address the heavy dependence on imports. If you are importing a lot of the inputs into tourism, it definitely means that the, the value added uh, for the island um, is, is a lot lower because uh, a lot more of the, the value being generated by tourism is going out to import or to service tourism as well. So um, the, the policymakers and the stakeholders saw addressing these issues as key -ish areas in relation to tourism and finding ways of how we can utilize the you know, green certification and measurement and green in tourism as, a, as important gaps that we needed to address. Uh, just five key recommendations that were put forward uh, by the stakeholders as a way of investment in greening. We can market Barbados as a green destination. Uh, we can develop heritage tourism sites. This is definitely a, a green policy recommendation. Um, you can invest more in agro-tourism. You can create uh, marine protected areas. All of these are, are green uh, investment options, and these can not only stimulate tourism, but they can also help to protect your natural environment as well. Um, I'm going to essentially wrap up here uh, so I can allow the other speakers to, to do their presentations, but the, uh, the, the, the key conclusion from the Green Economy Scope and Study was, yes, um, the, there's this traditional notion that the economy has a negative impact on the environment, but the recommendations and, and by looking at all of these sectors, we found that um, the green economy provides a really useful way or useful opportunity to enhance economic growth without ne necessarily damaging the environment and also creating really great jobs uh, within the Caribbean and within Barbados. So Chair, I'm gonna hand over to you. Yes. Thanks very much, Professor Moore, uh, for very insightful presentation and I like how you merge the issue of the economy being um, you know kind of counterintuitive to the preservation of the environment and also ecology and we do believe that in terms of lives and livelihoods they can both coexist and so we definitely um, would support this particular green economy um, approach and also the blue economy because it is utilizing our natural resources and preserving our environments because we must live in it as well. So I thank you very much. And now we will turn our attention to Dr. Legina Henry, um, hailing from the Department of Computer Science. 
uh, physics and mathematics um, at the Faculty of Science and Technology. And she will be presenting, sorry, on renewable fuels and renewable um, energy vehicular transport. So over to you, Dr. Henry, um, you can begin your presentation. And I find this rather exciting that we can, rather than using the fuels that we are accustomed to using, diesel and gasoline, that we can actually produce and use um, transportation fuel right here in Barbados. So over to you now, Dr. Henry. Could you just unmute your mic, sorry? I think you're still muted. Yeah, who does that? Who forgets to mute their mic? Sorry about, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I agree with you. It's exciting to have a source of fuel um, from what is right now a crisis in Barbados. And so we'll talk about that. And not just Barbados, the, the, the whole region is dealing with the issue of the inundation of sargassum, seaweed from the ocean. Okay, so the title of the talk is Sargassum Seaweed, a source of transportation fuel for Barbados. And I'm Dr. Legina Henry. I am the lecturer for renewable energy um, in the Renewable Energy Development Lab, which is part of the Department of Computer Science, Math and Physics at the University of the West Indies in Cape Hill, Barbados. Um, so just quickly, I just wanna outline what um, I see a message coming in on the chat. Okay, good. Uh, so I, um, I'm gonna start off with a one slide primer. Uh, so it's not to scare you, but just to explain where sargassum fits in this whole mix and then um, why not sugarcane and why did we go to sargassum? And then we talk about tests that were done in the lab in collaboration with Dr. Holder at UE Cave Hill. Then what is the ongoing research? Where, where, which direction is this project going? And then our underlying principles of sustainability in all the work we've um, been doing. And then I'll wrap up. So eight slides. All right, so by methane can cheaply and easily power CNG converted vehicles. And I put ICE, meaning internal combustion engine, which if most of us look outside, was parked outside, is an internal combustion engine vehicle. Of course, people like Winston have their, their cool electric car outside, but for the majority of people in Barbados and throughout the Caribbean, we drive internal combustion engine vehicles which run on gasoline, which may also run on diesel. Um, and Winston described very nicely the, the issues involved with that. Um, biomethane, which comes from the anaerobic digestion of biomass, can be put in your car that's parked outside and you could drive on it. How? If you do a CNG conversion on your car, which costs 500 US dollars now in the Caribbean. So it doesn't take a lot to go from the car you just drove to the grocery in to green um, transport fuel and, and benefits to the environment. Okay. Um, so let me just, so I'll go through the graphics. The first one is an example of a CNG car, the Fiat Sienna Tetra Fuel 2. Um, and there are two different ranges right now of you could actually buy a CNG drivetrain car. There's the, the luxury range for people who are into that kind of thing. And then for me, um, kids who just needs to get around, um, there's also the, the economy type cars that you could just buy off the shelf, um, CNG. Um, India is producing the economy type models where you can find some of the, um, the, the luxury models of CNG cars in Europe. And then, um, Pakistan provides the most of the world the CNG conversion kits where you could convert your regular Ford EcoSport parked outside into um, a CNG drive train. Um, then anaerobic digestion, which is a process by which you're gonna take green matter and convert it to transportation fuel is a multi-step process, but very important in the process is it's water intensive. The majority of what goes into your anaerobic digester, digester is water. 
and then you have to have some sort of um, feedstock and then a source of bacteria. And, um, and I think Nikolai will go more into that, those details. Um, so I'll just describe what we need to understand this project. Uh, so right now in Barbados, there's a natural gas pipeline, it's a grid that covers most of the island. Um, this was a estimate of a generalized version of the grid. Act uh, since, since I've drawn this, I actually got the actual data set from, from BNOC for a project and um, is, a, is a lot more detailed than this and far and widespread throughout the island. Um, Barbados has this extensive natural gas grid that could be retrofitted for biogas as she transitions to 100% renewable energy by the year 2030. And so any point along the grid, we could figure out how to upgrade to, to refuel these cars with, with biogas. So these, the um, hints of the solution are already here. Um, and so when we're talking about um, anaerobic digestion to produce biomethane, you have to find a feedstock. And so I started this project in summer 2019 with five undergrad students at UE Cave Hill. And the first feedstock we thought about was sugarcane. And we spent a few weeks looking at sugarcane and then came to a conclusion that we didn't think sugarcane would be a solution. Why? All right, so the country we modeled when we thought about sugarcane in Barbados being a transportation fuel was Brazil. Because right now, more than two thirds of the, the transport fuel burned in Brazil comes from the sugarcane industry. And um, we thought, why not just make a little tiny Brazil right here in Barbados? Um, and then we learned a lot of things about the sugarcane ecosystem of Brazil. Um, there are some sugarcane fields in Brazil that are comparable to the size of Barbados. So the, the scale is different. Um, to fuel that sugarcane ecosystem, there's other crops that come into play like seeds for oil and um, certain other parts of, of their economic makeup that allow Brazil to produce an economy that depends on their sugar cane. And so the Brazilian sugar industry has been growing um, consistently over the past 50 years. And this is just 10 years of data on the graphic versus Barbados. In Barbados for the past seven decades, the sugar cane industry has been on the decline. And this is just an example. This is just a depiction of the last, well, of a 10 year data set that was available to us in 2019 from the statistical service, Barbados Statistical Service, uh, showing the decline in the sugarcane output of Barbados. Um, and this is just me and that team of students um, in 20, summer 2019. And we're not wearing face masks because it was 2019 back when nobody knew what a face mask was. Okay. So we did some calculations that summer to come to our conclusion. And one of them was we looked at the 2017 sugarcane crop um, of Barbados. And we said in 2017, Barbados produced 10,000 um, tons of sugar, um, sugar cane. Um, so we looked at that and we thought if these 10,000 tons were repurposed for bioethanol, which is what is being done in Brazil, how much of the transportation in the year 2018 would the entire national sugar cane output produce? And that amounted to just 6%. So just 6% of the transportation need would have been covered if the whole of Barbados said, we're not gonna eat any sugar, we're just gonna use all this cane and we're just gonna drive cars on it. It would only cover 6% of the driving that happened in 2018. So again, the numbers didn't measure up uh, in terms of sugar cane as a biofuel crop to support transportation. So now we, we looked at, we looked at sargassum, the person, one of the students, Brittany actually suggested, why don't we look at sargassum? And I thought, why not? You are biology major, you're interested in the lab, let's hit the ground, you probably hit the ground running. So we, we look at it. We did some lit reviewing. Brooks 2018 gives this map of one year of sargassum biomass aggregate in the, the Atlantic Ocean. And then Wong 2019, shows these um, distribution maps of the sargassum inundation um, from 2011 up to 2018. 
and both authors based on their projections using biological, physical, and chemical oceanography and then projection models. See, the sargassum seaweed we see, the inundation on our shores, it's here to stay. It is a stable crisis, which, I mean, the, the tourism industry and a lot of industries think of this as a crisis. For us in the energy space, we think of it as a resource. So we're saying this resource is here to stay. So why not utilize it? So sargassum seaweed right now delivers more biomass than any all our islands put together could actually produce and grow. But it also wreaks havoc on primarily tourism-based economies. I'm seeing messages coming into the chat. Um, let me just make sure it's not somebody telling me I'm out of time. Okay, good. No, that's not what's happening. All right. Um, so this is a, an example of a beach in Tobago um inundated with sargassum we've all seen it right um this is these are satellite images from nasa this is nation news barbados and we've seen the, the, the sargassum on the beaches we know what it does to tourism we know what it does to public health uh and so it is it is a a problem which we need to approach and our our solution is make it a, make this problem an opportunity so we see sargassum seaweed well, we, we said, let's look at it as a feedstock. And remember, I said on the second slide, you need a lot of water for anaerobic digestion. And there's word of Barbados is water scarce. How are you gonna run the transportation sector on this water intensive process? And our answer is use wastewater from industry. So we went that summer to Foursquare Rum Distillery and Mount Gay Rum Distillery and use their distillery waste um, to, uh, one second. yeah, we use the distillery waste to run tests um, on how does it co-digest with, with, with the sargassum seaweed. And we, we, we had some promising results. And again, just to talk about what's going on in the images, that's me and my students at the two rum distilleries I mentioned. This is a biomethane setup on UE campus, which Dr. Holder pictured here, who's going to speak after me. He actually um, produces biomethane on campus, which runs all the Bunsen burners, I think, in the chemistry department in, in Cave Hill. And, and there is um, there's word to, to expand that to the wider campus, so all the um, Bunsen burners on campus. So this is a real actual resource. Two years, for two years, some barrels of grass have been supplying energy to labs on campus. So this is a, a reality and, and, and um, Dr. Holder is very much involved in making it, making it a reality. It is a potential and he's making it a reality. So with the help of Dr. Holder, this is Shamika Spencer. She's my MPhil student and she actually spent the last year, we, Brittany got results that first summer looking at Mount Gay Rum Distillery and Foursquare Rum Distillery um, waste, co-digested with sargassum seaweed. Um, for the past year, uh, UE Cave Hill graduate student Shamika Spencer um, used the same system which Nikolai came up with as his PhD work, which is using microdigesters. So you could perform hundreds of tests on a lab bench uh, at once. And so this is uh, Shamika preparing samples for her biomethane tests using Nikolai's method and with the help of Nikolai um, to co-digest sargassum with distillery waste. So, um, so this is just a description of the test for the interest of time. I'm not gonna go too much into it, but basically we had various pretreatments. Um, we had different rum distillery waste, and we um, compared them the, the output, the gas output, um, to controls within the experiments. And all of this sargassum was collected by hand by the students on local beaches on the south, north and south coasts. All right. Uh, so the results are in, and they're good. What do I mean by good? Well, in 2018, um, Nikolai produced a paper showing the biomethane output of wild cane, sugar cane, elephant grass. And you would expect that these approximate what the gas output of the standard grasses being projected in Barbados as biofuel grasses. 
this is the this is the standard. This is what they produce in terms of normal milliliters of methane per gram of fresh matter in how many days. But when we compare the sargassum seaweed co-digested with rum distillery waste and a bacterial source, we see promising and comparable and even bigger numbers in, on, on day 11 of the test. So we're saying this sargassum seaweed co-digested with the right things can actually be just as um, productive as the, the biofuel grasses being fielded now in, in the energy space in this country. Later on, Shamika tested, um, so that was Brittany's uh, results in the lab with Nikolai. So Shamika's results. And she so, um, she actually increased it to not just Mount Gay and Foursquare, but also West Indies rum distillery waste and St. Nicholas Abbey rum distillery waste. And looked at the, um, the, the, the biomethane out of um, the sargassum co-digested with these different distillery waste. Again, promising results. Um, so what's next? So this summer, we actually setting up some boom biogas systems about it will approximate 5,000 liters of rum distillery waste with sargassum seaweed to produce biogas on a larger scale. Our hope is by the end of the year to be driving a CNG converted car on biogas being produced in the lab now by the student. And the main point of that driving is to to eventually um, run a larger experiment, maybe with a, a fleet of 100 cars, but to get drive cycle data for cars in Barbados being driven on sargassum produced biogas. Um, and looking at that in terms of, you need to be rigorous about your numbers if you wanna project big business plans and, and, and um, monetize and commercialize these kinds of solutions. Um, this is an example. RENAC actually had a biofuel course earlier this year, and we actually, I, I, I took the ENS, the 2003 class, Sustainable Energy Systems students, and had them look at biogas and try to, to project the size of a biogas plant and um, how much power out um, of the plant. And so that's one of the detailed calculations we want to make now in terms of if you were to write a business plan to commercialize this idea, how much sargassum would you need? What size of a digester to produce the enough energy for this amount of um, the transport in Barbados? And so simultaneous with that, um, we're doing calculations on what is the driving energy? What, how much energy does Barbados use every year in driving? Um, on traffic routes, the regular routes every day. All right, so the, the, um, we, so we actually trying to put together a team now, but let me just say, this is a description of the, the solution in phases. And I'm actually trying now to build it out into a sort of a, um, looking at the, the every step of this experiment as potential um, business um, potential business plans. But um, stepping back, I would like to say that, so Winston, Professor Moore spoke about the, this dichotomy between development and the environment. And again, over and over as we speak about sustainability and about things like biogas, and for every solution, it opens up 10 more questions. So we're talking about electric vehicles, but where does the cobalt come from for all the electric cars that will be implemented in the world in the next 10 years? Um, is, it, is it sustainably, and is it done in a way that's sustainable? Is it done in a way that cares about life on land? Um, are there partnerships involved? So we, our approach to this experiment, to this business plan, to all of the work we're doing in terms of the transportation solution from sargassum seaweed, we, we use these um, principles of sustainability, the sustainable development goals, there's 17 produced by the United Nations. And we see that our solution kind of touches on many of the goals, uh, but in particular touches on some of them. But very important to us is that when we harvest the sargassum, it is done in a way that respects life underwater, life on the beach, the ecosystem, um, 
a tourism on the beach. Uh, so so that the, the our approach is not um, insular and insulated in the lab, but we are approaching the solution from the standpoint of does it produce sustainability and are these different arms of the solution sustainable? All right, so one just final reflection before I close. Um, much of the work that I described to you is being funded by Blue Chip Foundation in New York. And so I just usually acknowledge Blue Chip Foundation um, who gave us a, a grant in, at the end of 2019 to continue to execute the experiments. So we wanna thank Blue Chip Foundation. Um, I just also want to thank the, the Brahm Industries, the students who worked on this, um, BNOC, Fel Felicia Cox at BNOC, Nikolai Holder, who is our um, biofuel guru, our anaerobic digestion guru, Renique Marie, who is in UE St. Augustine, and actually sat with me and my students and walked through, this is carbon, hydrogen, these are the different molecules, and this is the process of anaerobic digestion. And, and gave us kind of confidence to move into the experiments and these projections. And then the IDB funded these stipends for these students that first summer. I want to thank the IDB. But I put this map of Barbados sitting in the dust from the last two free year um, eruption on April 9th. And why I put it is to remind us of our vulnerability and to remind us of we're a country in transition moving from 100% basically fossil fuel powered to 100% sustainable renewable energy powered. And we have to think about our vulnerabilities as we think of solutions. In my mind, biofuel is one of these sources of fuel that is a gift that keeps on giving. And it, it is transportable, it's storable. It, it, um, it can be seen as a backup fuel when other sources of fuel fail. That, the only three days we had of just dark darkness in Barbados because of the inundation of the volcanic ash, our solar panels didn't work. I, I didn't have hot water when I opened the, the tap, my, my shower or my, my kitchen. There was no hot water. Um, some people probably didn't have their backup electricity or God forbid they didn't have electricity for three days. Um, but we need to think when we think about solutions and about change, we have to think from the standpoint, not only of sustainability, but also of resilience and about vulnerability. And with that, I would like to say thank you. And, um, Move on, move along in the panel to to, to whoever else, and I'll, I'll welcome questions when we have a discussion at the end. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Henry, and I think on behalf of all of us, I want to really commend you for the wonderful work that you've been doing along with your students. Um, it's very very encouraging, uh, groundbreaking as well, and I think there are a number of people who would. Um, be very interested in finding out more about using compressed natu natural gas CNG for uh, transportation in Barbados. So we're hopeful that you can actually reach the stage where you can have that fleet of 100 cars so you can do your preliminary estimate and then um, build out a business plan that would um, see Barbados moving more in the direction of using uh, renewable fuels and away from fossil fuels. And I also like the fact that you mentioned the vulnerabilities that we currently face in the Caribbean. Um, that is all underpinned by biosecurity. And uh, Professor Moore would have mentioned the issue of air pollution. We also have another initiative that is closely aligned with this one as well. And obviously your work also is a mitigation action against air pollution as well. So we think that this is all very Intriguing, exciting, and uh, we can't wait to, to have these actions implemented, not only in Barbados, but right throughout the, the Caribbean. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we turn our attention to Dr. Nikolai Holder, and he will be presenting on biomass to biogas. And um, I assure you, it's very interesting and very intriguing and also exciting. So with no... For the adieu, uh, Dr. Holder, um, you you can have the floor. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Let me just share my presentation. Can everyone see that? Yes, yes, Nicolai. Thanks. Okay. Oh, thank you. So my presentation today is going to be on sustainability, and I'm going to be looking at anaerobic digestion, which into biogas and the biogas of course can be used as a fuel. So what is sustainability? So I got this definition of sustainability from Investopedia. Sustainability focuses on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their needs. So the concept is composed of three pillars, economic, environmental, or social, also known informally as profits, planet, and people. So it was just a Google search that I did for this definition. And I went this route because this is what the average person is really going to um, investigate or find when they look up the definition of sustainability. Okay. Now, as Professor Moore said earlier, initially people focused on economic development and not so much on the environment because there was this notion that Every there was no limit to what we had, that resources were not finite, that the earth was vast and expansive, and we could just continue to take from it and take from it and take from it, and we would not run out of anything. However, as time passed and as we evolved, we realized that was actually not the case. Okay. And then we started getting into more bioeconomic and circular processes. And I have a diagram here that highlights a uh, type that uh, highlights sustainable processes are the circular economy. So you have biomass and you can have carbon dioxide through carbon sequestration being converted into the raw material. You have your processing and then it gets you get your products coming out and then you recycle the material at the end. So that is the idea behind it. And it's also the way in which cells function. They take in materials, they excrete waste, the waste becomes a substrate for some other organisms, and then you have a whole cyclic um, food chain, so to speak. Now, our current economic processes mainly are linear. You have your fuel, which normally comes from fossil fuel sources, and you have your raw materials. In this case, I use the example of food crops. So sugar cane, corn, and so on. You get your harvesting of the crops. You have your fuel that's used to drive the tractors and the processing, the transportation, and so on. You get your intended products. The intended products get sold. You get your profit. You get your money. You get your waste, your unwanted products, and they just go and get dumped. And that's it. And that was based on, like I said earlier, the whole that there was no limit to the resources that we had on this planet. However, there is a limit. And if we can just do a very small tweak on this process by adding something that completes the loop, we can transform it into a circular or possibly bioeconomic or bio-based process. Okay. Through the use of anaerobic digestion, we can take the waste if it is in a bioorganic form, and you can convert it to biomethane, which can be used as a fuel to drive the process. And it can also be used as a fertilizer. Well, another product from the anaerobic digestion process is the digestate, and the digestate can be used as a fertilizer. And that fertilizer is organic, and then can be reapplied to the fields. You grow back your crops, and then you have a circular process. And of course, you can have the crops being produced, let's say like sweet potatoes, you can use the sweet potatoes directly, or you can go into agro-processing and produce sweet potato flour, for example. You can produce sweet potato vodka. So there are a number of different value-added products that you can make, and it's, you can produce them at a very low cost if you are producing the fuel that you need to provide the energy for the process in a sustainable manner. Anaerobic digestion technology, and I have here 
a very large anaerobic digester. And the, the anaerobic digester, it's just a very large water tank. That's pretty much it. Uh, it's sealed completely, it's airtight, and it provides a home for millions of microorganisms of, from thousands, hundreds of thousands of different species, which work in an anaerobic environment to biochemically convert various forms of biomass into fuel, CH4, methane. Now we normally or currently would get our methane from fossil fuel-based sources, and it's commonly referred to as natural gas. This methane is produced bio biochemically, it's renewable, and it can be used as a direct replacement for natural gas. And as Dr. Henry said earlier, it can be used to also power vehicles in the form of compressed natural gas. And it can also be used to produce electricity by feeding it into uh, to a turbine or a generator. Aside from the fuel, you have a residue which is rich in nutrients because what happens is the, the that would be like the phosphates and the ammonia and so on, they get converted to, or they get concentrated in the digestate. So now you have a digestate that is very rich in these nutrients that can act as a fantastic organic fertilizer. I'm going to demonstrate or illustrate some of the results of some experiments that we conducted here on campus using the digestate on some crops later down in the presentation. Now the feedstocks that can go into the anaerobic digester to produce the fuel can include the coconut husks, the used old newspaper, the tried the sargasm seaweed, as Dr. Henry had mentioned earlier, in the gas, various grasses, fish offal, and we're currently investigating a number of different substrates, potential substrates that we have on the island, see how efficiently they produce, uh, produce methane, how efficiently they're biodegrading the anaerobic digester, and if possible, how to improve on the efficiencies of biodegradation, fuel production, and digestate production from the different types of, um, of potential feedstocks. So lab scale research that can actually be implemented on a real world scale to produce fuel and digest it to benefit the wider community. So one example that I'm gonna show where we can use anaerobic digestion technology to form a more circular economic process is in the fishing industry, okay? So currently we go, we take the fish from the sea, we harvest them, we gut them, and we generally just eat a very small part of the fish. So I actually have empirical data that shows that the offal, which is all the material that's highlighted in the red box, all of, that's that, all of it is discarded and it actually accounts for 60% of the mass of the fish. So the majority of what we catch, we throw away, it just gets dumped. It can't be thrown back out to sea. Um, there's rules and regulations on that. And it just goes to the landfill currently, unfortunately. And it's also used to make some animal feed as well. But if we can use anaerobic digestion technology to utilize the fish offal, we can help to bioprocess it and convert it into fuel, which can possibly be used to run the engines on the fishing boats and we can convert it into digestate. So you can now have something from the blue economy and the marine environment benefiting the green economy or the land-based terrestrial plant environment. And this is a way that anaerobic digestion technology can be used to merge different ecospheres, so to speak, in a type of environmental economic um, setting. So here is the, here's an example of the crop experiment that I was talking about. We used corn for this experiment. Um, it was the second test we did. The first one was a preliminary experiment where we had used the tomatoes. And, but this one here gave us some very good results, as you can see. So on the top left, we have to digest it, which comes from, uh, we just take it out the anaerobic digester and apply it directly. And it looks kind of like cow dung more or less. Um, 
And that is, is pretty similar, to be quite honest. A lot of the organic carbon is converted to biomethane, and then you get the nutrients being, con uh, being concentrated. We applied the digestate in different amounts to some corn plants. We had let germinate. They all got to about 16 millimeters in height. And everyone had the same germination time, air, water, sunlight. We kept all the variables constant except the amount of digestate. And as you see in the picture on the right, where we have increasing amounts of digestate, we have a corresponding directly proportional increase in the height of the corn plants. And not just the height, but also the thickness in the diameter of the stalk and the amount of chlorophyll in the leaves. So the plants are bigger and healthier and people who saw the experiment live actually asked us, because we're in the science department, they asked us, us if it's a new species of corn and if it's giant corn. And we said, no, this is just how corn is supposed to grow once it's treated properly. And you can see we can actually grow corn and possibly other plants. We have to do the actual empirical studies on those other plants, but we can grow them to at, at a rate at least double what we can produce them at now. And this is just our regular soil in Barbados. So the one on the left is a representation of if you had to plant the corn in our regular soil now, just water it every day. The one and everyone else is increasing digested and the one on the far right, that would be the ideal situation. And this was within five weeks. And as Dr. Henry said earlier, the use of the anaerobes of the biomethane to run the Bunsen burners in the labs. So we would have done a number of different laboratory scale tests using the, the mini micro digesters that I have in the lab that I developed. And then we apply that data on a type of, on a real world setting using the anaerobic digester that we have on campus. And we compress that biomethane into the regular LPG cylinders. And we have connected up to the main lines that power the building. And we were able to supply the, we were able to replace the traditional fossil-based LPG with our bio-based biomethane produced from, it was about two garbage bags every month or so of grass. Yeah. So in conclusion, the anaerobic digestion biotechnology can play a tremendous role in the development of new and the transformation of existing economic processes and economies, and it touches on a large amount of the, of the sustainable development goals, especially climate action, because the use of fossil fuels produces a lot of greenhouse gases. And of course, we use the fossil fuels to get the energy that we need. And if we can use renewable energy, forms of renewable energy to, to get that energy, then we can somehow negate the negative impacts of fossil fuel use on climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well, um, Dr. Holder. Very interesting um, presentation. And as you can see at the university, there are some really, really exceptional um, researchers who are doing some really groundbreaking work and very um, applicable research as well that is um, very useful, very, uh, intriguing, and I think that you can all agree that this is wonderful and augurs well for the future of the Caribbean as well. And now we turn our attention to our final presenter, and this would be Dr. Shan Kofi uh, Young, and she is from CL Environmental Services in Trinidad. She is a waste um, management educator. And I open the floor to you, uh, Ms. Young. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Douglas. I was not going to say I've taken the doctor at the beginning, I know, I've taken it. <laughs> uh, maybe that is a sign of things to come, who knows? Uh, but thank you very, very much. And I am happy to be a part um, of this esteemed I feel very honored to be a part of such um, of such an esteemed panel. Um, so let me just delve right in. 
I would preface my conversation by saying that I am an entrepreneur in the waste management sector. So as much as I'm also specifically a waste educator, um, a lot of my conversation is covered under entrepreneurship, um, under you know, the possibilities, because I always see the opportunities. I don't necessarily just see you know, this, the challenge, um, because I know that there is lots of room for opportunity as well. So let me just make sure everybody's seeing my... Okay, great. Hoping everybody can see this now. Yeah? Yes, we can. So okay, you can go ahead, Sharon. Awesome, great. So um, the my talk is going to center. It's, so it's, it's a little bit of a marriage of what you could before um, without specific focus. I'm so happy that I told Dr. Henry that I am super excited to be driving a car that is powered by biomethane from sargassum seaweed. Um, and I just recently concluded uh, my short course in waste management with you St. Augustine, where we mentioned what Dr. Henry talked about, anaerobic digestion um, and, the, and the possible opportunities and uses for it. Not in as much detail, but just so they have an idea of that is an option that is available to us in the Caribbean. So I just wanted to, to start by saying solid waste management is not just the disposal end, which is where I think we place a lot of focus at times. It involves the collection, the transport, the treatment, the handling, the processing, and also the disposal of waste. Um, and the management of municipal solid waste, so waste coming from your households, is usually responsible by local governments, as it is in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we call them municipalities or regional corporations. They have the responsibility for the collection of municipal waste. Um, and this tends to consume anywhere between 20 to 50% of municipal budgets. I think for us in Trinidad and Tobago, we sit like around 40% roughly. Um, so that is still a huge chunk of the budget that is going towards um, waste collection. So I just wanted to also talk about waste and sustainability. Now, we also have the issue where, and there are some cases where the cart is in front of the horse, right? Things have been allowed to blossom, for lack of a better word, or just get so big that it seems that the problem is unsolvable. Waste is considered to be a wicked problem, meaning that there is no single solution or no one thing that we can do that will help solve it. It has to be a combination of things, of educators, of psychologists, of communicators, of waste handlers, everybody coming together to really help to solve the waste problem. But this goes back to what sustainable waste management is, which firstly, it is about the generation of less waste. That is the definition. That's where we all have to look at as our starting point followed by the reuse of consumables. And then I'm going to go a little bit into the waste management hierarchy because yes, it does exist. And we will see how some of the things we have been doing and where they fall or where they should fall. And then followed by the recovery, um, the recycling and the recovery of waste that is produced. I will also say at this point, um, jumping ahead that Waste is governed by uh, Sustainable Development Goal 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And I want us to also be mindful of those two words that are used. Consu consumption in terms of what we use and what is produced. Oftentimes, a lot of emphasis is placed on the consumption side and not enough emphasis is placed on the production side for us to really be able to deal with some of the items that we have, we really need to start paying more attention and placing more emphasis on what is being manufactured, what is being produced, and how that could be managed at the end of its life. Um, because Mahatma Gandhi says the earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, 
for not every man's greed. And we find now for varying reasons, for convenience, for ease, for accessibility, that we've just created more, the UN has already said. And if we do not reduce our consumption patterns, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by the year 2050. So all of these things is what we really have to start paying critical attention to. So I wanted to include, this is a snippet or just, I just extracted this from the last waste characterization study that was done in 2010. Um, and this is just a breakdown of how our waste materials, how they rank basically. Um, and this is not unique only to Trinidad and Tobago because the World Bank also issued several reports and there are other reports coming out from the IDB and so on with which cements this, which confirms this, that in the Caribbean and in Latin America as well, the majority of the waste that we produce is organic. So even though a lot of the emphasis may be on plastics because of its pervasiveness, because of its um, lack of, of its recycling rates, especially for us in the Caribbean, is not as high as it needs to be. Our current recycling rate in Trinidad and Tobago is roughly between six and 7%. However, approximately 84, 85, 84.97% of all waste is recyclable, which includes, um, and this is what came out of this study. So organics, 27%, followed by plastics, 19. Paper, both of them are tied at 19%, glass at 10, and then everything else. But when you add up all those percentages, you get roughly about 84%. So, we still have a ways to go in terms of our recycling rates, in terms of how we are managing all of these different forms of waste, how we're dealing with it at the household level, because that is where, um, that is the source, and we talk about source separation. Um, so these are the areas that we have to start, you know, recognizing and paying some attention to. So I wanted to just, um, qualify a lot of what I'm saying by giving you guys the results of this study. Um, we are due to have another one that typical waste characterization studies are typically done between every 10, 15 years or so. Um, so we are due to have another one. I'm not sure if that, if that is on the table at present. I know in Tobago has been seriously reconsidering um, doing another study. Um, and as such, that would probably seep across into Trinidad as well. So, right, so I was talking about this in the beginning. And I often say that the three R's are no longer enough. We have continued to talk and teach about the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. However, this specific picture, I normally use this to talk to my homeowners when, I, when I'm asking them to do things differently, right? Um, so we have at first, the first R that is not there is refuse right or where prevention would sit and that is in the other the other slide when we talk about commercial um waste generation so we have refused we have reduced reuse we have refill right the refill culture in the caribbean is, is not as large as it is in the us but there are a number of entrepreneurs that i know of who have integrated a refill process as part of what they do so you can buy something from them return it and you get either like a discount or dollar off or something as they refill your containers, right? So it is something that a lot of entrepreneurs, especially those that are doing products are recognizing um, as a means for there to reduce their environmental footprint, their waste footprint. So that it is something that is still growing though. Then we have repair and repurpose, right? We have this thing, if it broke, do um, buy a new one. <laughs> Right. Um, I am also a mother and I remember with one of my children's teachers said the button on the microwave was not working. And one of the one of the parents said, so why don't we just buy a new microwave? And Miss had to reiterate, um, Daddy, nothing is wrong with the microwave and it's just the button that needs to be fixed. So we have this thing where a little thing goes wrong and we decide we want to get rid of it without even seeing if it could be repaired. Right. I am repairing things so much until my little fix it man says, Mrs. Young, don't bring anything else because I don't think we could fix it anymore, right? We fixed it several times. 
We have repurposing as well, which is where the whole upcycling industry, which is a burgeoning industry in terms of the entrepreneurial, the waste entrepreneurial space is the whole issue of repurposing, taking something of lower value, which, which is considered to be waste and turning, in that, turning that into a product of higher value. So we have one of my very good friends takes old vinyl records um, and turns them into clocks. I have another one that uses glass bottles and converts them into lamps. We have other people taking old vinyl panels and turning them into book bags, pencil cases, and, and the list goes on. Um, so it, it provides a really good opportunity to utilize waste materials. And we sh I'm sure those of us on, the, on this webinar have seen the videos being shared. Up to yesterday, I watched the one with plastic waste being turned into bricks, right? Which is not a new concept. It's just, it's now being uh, used more frequently. Right, but it has, it has existed, especially in certain parts of Europe, it has existed for quite some time. Then we have replace, so after you've tried all of those other things, that's where replace comes in and then recycle. Too often we use it, the word recycling as a plaster for every saw, um, and we have to be very, very careful of that. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, our recyclers carry blast works because they take old bottles and convert them into new ones. Um, so a lot of people just say we recycle, recycle. What is really happening is that the items are being collected to be recycled. Yeah, so we have to be mindful of how that term is used as well. And then after that, it gets to the bin. So you see how many things we are supposed to be doing before we even get to recycling, before we even get to the point of throwing things away. And one of the hours that is missing is one of my other favorites, which is rot, where we are taking organic waste coming from our kitchens and our yards and turning them into compost, which is my favorite activity. Um, and it's something that I also teach other homeowners to do is to start their own compost heaps. So all of these things are where we need to go on. And this part now, this is where we're looking at waste and it's a larger quantity. It's very, very similar to what I showed you before with a couple of new changes, right? So of course, prevention, remember the goal of sustainable waste management is to simply generate less waste. So that is always the beginning. Then we have reduction. And in between reduction and recycling is where the circular economy sits. Because as um, I think as Dr. Henry was talking about, it being a linear cycle, the take make waste is typically a linear cycle. However, now we have recognized that that is not sufficient. So we have to move to the circular economy. But the fun fact is, is that the circular economy principles have always been around. They haven't, it is that they have not necessarily been used in mass, in great majority, right? My parents gave me a number of stories. My mother loves anchar and she said, Shana used to get anchar on leaves, on fig leaves, on banana leaves. And I would lick the leaf when I was smaller right? And then that leaf would go into be made into compost. So circular economy principles always existed. It's just that we make the decision for some of the um, reasons I gave before that we want to switch to make things faster, easier now. But that is also a way that we waste items. We waste things in producing overproduction and in inventory, in transportation costs. There's a lot of wastage going on there as well. And then recovery. And the thing about recovery is that it should only be done if all of the others above it did not work. So we have to look at our waste characterization, our waste composition. What are the form of waste that, are, that we are producing in our respective countries? And what are the possible solutions for it? Because waste of energy, and this is my personal opinion, um, we should really think before we do things like that, I have been a part of a team where we reviewed a number of waste and energy initiatives. And the question was always, would we have, we have enough to start the plan, but do we have enough to continue? And normally for waste and energy to work, you need items of high caloric value. So you're talking about tires, you're talking about plastic bottles. And if you're using the plastic bottles, then the recycling and industry or the, the upcycling industry um, it's not going to be at its optimum because you have to use those items to give you the kinds of energy that you want to produce to make waste of energy um, the right choice. 
and then we get to disposal. So incineration is a form of recovery as well, but that is typically used for our biomedical waste. Now the waste handlers with COVID-19 has presented a different challenge because um, masks and gloves are considered biomedical waste. And now they have integrated into our domestic waste streams. How are we dealing with that? We have people who are at home quarantining. Um, are they taking, they should be separating the waste as a result of, I have a very good friend who is COVID-19 positive right now and is at home, right? Um, and make sure and tell him, okay, keep the waste as a result of taking care of yourself uh, separate from your regular domestic waste because we're talking about transmission and the fact is that our sanitation workers are not the best equipped at all times. That is a reality. Um, so we need to protect our sanitation workers as well. So in general, um, we generate 2.37 kilograms. In Trinidad and Tobago, it's actually about 1.4 kilograms per person today. But this is the Caribbean as a whole. Um, the collection rate uh, generally, and this is coming out of a study that was done <coughs> with the IDB, with the Solid Waste Management in the Caribbean document. Um, and only a few Caribbean nations dispose of their solid waste in sanitary, sorry about those spell error there, in sanitary landfills. Um, because we have open dump sites, we have semi landfills where there's limited covering of the waste with dirt. And then we have the sanitary engineered sites and not many of our islands have engineered sites. St. Lucia is one of the sites that I know and Barbados that have engineered facilities, right? So those are the things that we have to pay attention to as well. So when Dr. Douglas asked me to talk about the economic impact, um, I was a little stumped because I wanted to one make sure that I covered what maybe what maybe expected to be covered, um, but I also just wanted to give because this to give you guys enough for for you to have some food for thought um, because we have not placed a lot of emphasis on the economic side of waste um, because the the whole handling of waste is really where our heads hurt. Um, that is where we try to focus and spend a lot of our time. Um, but what are some of the economic um, instruments that we can use? Um, you know, and, and according to the SIDS Waste Management Outlook Report, reducing waste can save municipalities between 35 US to 400 US a ton, depending on the, the location of the waste prevention activity and the technologies used. And one of the things that we also have in the Caribbean is the informal waste sector. So we have our waste companies, agencies, private public partnerships, that it is their responsibility to manage waste. But we also have the waste pickers, the salvagers, the scavengers, which form a part of the informal side of waste collection. Do we ignore that or do we give them the opportunity to form themselves into cooperatives so that they can have more efficient and effective operations. I remember um, I used to work for the solid waste management company in Trinidad for a number of years. Um, every time we tried to stop the salvagers, there would be a big uproar because there are financial and social impacts associated with that. But then I saw this fantastic movie called Wasteland. If you guys have not seen it, you should. Um, where they were at one of the largest um, waste sites in Brazil. And they have, that was the first time I saw a scavengers association. So they formed a cooperative to govern what they did at the site, right? And that would also help in um, developing contingencies to mitigate eventual drops in the world's recyclables. Um, in many countries, the existing legal and regulatory framework would need to be adapted in order to provide the necessary regulation for the different strategies that we would need. Um, and of course, we go back to looking at the circular economy and the fact that industries should look at that as much as possible within their processes and 
Here we also bring in incentives and disincentives because both work. Um, and the use of both in order to encourage or to deter um, from the actions that we want. So, and so if we want higher rates of reuse, higher rates of recycling, we could look at providing incentives, right? But recycling is heavily, heavily impinged on market availability. Is there a market for this particular product? And what is the cost of that product at the market? So we may have to consider developing new products and new markets, right? So have benches, roofing, paving tiles, right? Um, that we can use within the Caribbean as well as viable options. We have the boardwalk in Trinidad and Tobago um, in Chagaramas that is built from plastic lumber. You know, the question I asked, could that have been built with lumber coming out directly out of Trinidad and Tobago? Because I know some of it was imported, right? So it's an opportunity to create markets that may not have necessarily existed, but to also produce the, to create the enabling environment for entrepreneurs to want to get into this sector so that we can create some of these things that are required, right? Um, Sion, just not to, uh, disrupt, uh, disrupt you, but um, I think your presentation is going around 20 minutes. And okay. so uh, we had originally assigned 10 minutes All right. because we want to get to the question and answer and also the panel. So if you don't mind, if you can perhaps wrap up. Um, don't mind at all. Don't mind at all. Don't mind at all. Okay. Thank right? you. So you're welcome. So we have um, financial and social impacts. And that goes back to how we, how we, an indicator for how good our country is doing is how well it manages its resources. And the fact that we are creating so much waste is an indication that we are not managing our resources as we should. Um, there are impacts and opportunities for waste. Um, the cost of waste collection, some call indicated they have, they would have spent 75 million TT dollars in one year just to manage our landfill sites. Um, but it also presents some opportunities as well um, to invest in education, entrepreneurship, informal operations, um, revenue generation, employment. Of course, this is what I am the most passionate about, which is behavior change and education. And the fact that the how has to change. Um, I recently published my first children's book on the rights called Kai's Magical Adventures, Where the Garbage Goes. So that is an opportunity to not to, in a story format, also give a lesson. Municipal waste collection in Caribbean households. Most of us, there is no charge. So we have to look at um, instruments such as fees and charges, taxes. And one of the biggest things is extended producer responsibility, making our producers and manufacturers responsible for what they are bringing into our markets um, so that they are responsible they too are responsible to what, for what happens at the end of the product's life and to utilize circular economy principles as much as possible. Um, so we also face the issue of a lack of, a lack of financial incentives, a lack of technology, um, and I'm all for um, making the waste sector very dynamic. So that is extremely important. But to always so also remember this, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So however we want to do things, that is the result that we're gonna get as a coming out of it as well. So we have to pay attention to that. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Leave the floor open for questions. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Young, for a very interesting presentation. I particularly like the social impacts of it and also the behavioral change. I think these are some things that perhaps in the discussion of waste and waste management um, within the region, not a lot of emphasis is actually placed on those particular um, issues. So thank you very much. And now we turn our uh, attention to uh, part of the program where we are going to be asking some uh, the panel one or two questions uh, regarding the, the um, issues surrounding waste management here in the Caribbean. And I would like to then ask the panelists to turn on their um, cameras 
and also the microphones as well, if they don't mind. So the first question is, um, what are some critical gaps that exist to prevent a sustainable pathway for um, Caribbean economic recovery, um, utilizing these waste streams um, around the Caribbean? And I will start with perhaps you, Dr. Henry, would you? Okay, so they're asking about gaps. What are the gaps? Yeah, so what, what for instance, in the field that you're working in, in terms yeah. of uh, the generation of renewable fuels, what okay. would be some of the gaps you think are there that we can uh, highlight that needs that need to be targeted? Yeah, so I'm answering this as a research scientist and a mechanical engineer. We, so one of the things we're doing is we are, the hope is to implement some kind of um, experiment, but still, I mean, it could still be a profitable experiment, which, which is the thing I described about, you get a hundred cars that have CNG drivetrain, drive them around Barbados and take drive cycle data from the cars. So what, so, so I don't think in terms of, what are the I think of what are the steps I need to take for this thing to work? Like we need to know what the numbers are and how we do that is by running experiments, very practical on the ground. As scientists, what we do is we always simplify before we, we complexify something. And so go back and ask, what are the simplest questions we can ask and the simplest sources of data? and uh, how real will can it be and, and how, how near to reality can the data set be before we make projections. So I would say as a scientist, as an academic, I, my, my approach to it is test what you're trying to implement, understand how it works in real life and then project um, forward, then expand, then move, um, move the question forward. Um, and if, if, if I were to answer about gaps, then I would say anything that stops the ability to test and, and to get your data, that would, that would be considered a gap. But for now, um, yeah, I, that, that's how I would respond to that. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's suffices. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Professor Moore, would you mind? Um, sure. um, definitely. Um, I think this is one of the cross-cutting issues that we would have looked at in the green economy scoping study. And uh, let me just use one example as, as something that we consider waste, but also has uh, potential value. And that is uh, fish waste. Uh, so there, there, there are many different byproducts of this. So some um, persons have utilized it, use the waste from fish in the, um, in the um, chicken, rearing and chicken production industry. So rather than seeing it as a waste product, you can actually utilize it in another aspect of, of agriculture. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, fish leather, um, but in order to put a fish leather system in place, you have to have a framework for collecting the, the fish uh, waste when you're scaling a, and, and boning the fish. So you have to have a, a proper approach to doing that and proper approach to storing and collection. So um, this just goes back to the, the traditional problems that economists always speak about. Uh, one, being finance. So you need finance to sort of put the uh, the system in place or to finance the, the test that a scientist like Legina is going to put in place. Um, so you need finance to do those test cases. You need regulation. Um, so if you're going to collect the waste uh, from the fish industry to, to develop a fish ladder industry, you need to have proper regulatory framework in place to ensure that um, you can have a very useful product as a result. And then one of the really bad words that um, economists use from time to time and, and is that word taxes. Um, I think when we, um, the, the whole idea behind green taxes is to sort of balance the scales. Um, we throw away a lot of um, really useful things as Mrs. Cuffey would have mentioned in her presentation. And 
the way how uh, economists will think about this is that you would want to ensure people think about the, the true life cycle value of a product. So if you are not taking into account the, the value of the product at the back end, then you need to tax that product at the front end. Uh, and that would be one of the things you'll need to do as well. So those would be three um, key things that I'll speak about. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, I think the, the concept of, of having people think before they purchase or even manufacture a product, and then also for persons doing distribution, especially within Caribbean economies, because um, the manufacturing is not as widespread as the distribution. Um, because of the limited manufacturing capacity, then it then offers the possibility of these persons in the distribution um, sector understanding the value of the products that they're bringing in and then also the um, responsibility that they have also on the back end in terms of waste generation at a national level. I'll turn over to um, Dr. Wilder um, to just get your um, thoughts on this as well. Yeah, so definitely. Um, in terms of the whole bio bioeconomic process, I think there might be too short of a scope in terms of the actual products that you think can be produced. So let's look at the let's look at the fruit industry, for example. Okay, you get the fruits, you pick them on the tree, and you then you just sell them. Okay, but what about then taking them and getting some jam? Okay, what about getting some wine? What about getting some brandy? What about then taking that mash and then producing some fuel? You can use it to power the process. Okay, so definitely you have to see all the possible byproducts of what you can of what you can get from what you're using, the energy cost to get those products, and what makes sense from an energy economics perspective. You're looking at the totality of the the value of whatever you are you have not only of the product, um, the initial product, but also the different byproducts of the the, the waste That's streams right. that are generated. Thanks. And over to you, Miss Kafiyan. Um. So I want to take. I'm going to be the evil one and take everything everybody said and just add a little bit. <laughs> right. Um. For me especially as an entrepreneur, it has not, the road has not been the easiest. Um, but because I consider myself to be a bit of a disruptor, I have found ways and means of getting things done. So going back to what Professor Moore said, um, financially, the environment needs to be enabling so that it fosters more entrepreneurs coming in and coming up with the solutions to some of the problems that we have. Um, I also still see the fact that we continue to do a lot of the same things education wise. I cannot um, emphasize that enough. And the fact is that we have to change how we educate people. Um, as somebody who is on the ground having conversations, asking hard questions, getting both sometimes asking the hard questions, um, that is what gets us to the point to really see what are the barriers to identify them. Um, remove those barriers, test our strategies, and then be able to implement them. Oftentimes, I think we implement them on a very, very large scale without even seeing what works, what doesn't work. And that's what um, Dr. Henry was, is mentioning as well too. The very simple things that we can do to help us to be able to make better decisions. Um, and to me, I will, I'll stop at those two major things for me. Okay, well, that, that, that sounds good. And that consolidates uh, what was mentioned before. And I really thank all of you panelists for your contribution, for your insightful and exciting presentations as well. Um, now we turn over to the question and answer section. Um, there are a few questions here and I'll take this one. Uh, this one is for Dr. Holder. I recently took Dr. Henry's Sustainable Energy Systems course, and it was really inspired to construct my own small scale biogas plant in my backyard this summer. However, as you are aware, 
the anaerobic digestion process produces many odorous gases such as hydrogen sulfide. Therefore, my question is, what techniques can be employed to mitigate the smell produced from this undertaking and not have my parents evicted? And I guess that's the rotten egg smell that hydrogen sulfide produces. Over to you, Dr. Okay. Dr. Um, Holder. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So when you actually construct the anaerobic digester, you need to make sure that it is fully sealed. All right? Once it's fully sealed, you're not going to get any smells. If you're getting any smells, that suggests to you that your gas is leaking and escaping from someplace. Okay, so that would actually be the solution. So first up, just check to see where the leaks are, okay? Um, and then when you actually burn the gas, you're not going to get any smell. The hydrogen sulfide is going to get converted. But what you can do is get some steel wool. So you can buy it from the hardware store and you can just have that in your in between your gas line. So a type of a gas trap, so to speak. And the steel wool will take the hydrogen sulfide out of the gas so it wouldn't corrode the burners. And then you can just leave it in the sun or put it in bake it in the oven. It'll regenerate it and you can just reuse it again. Thank you very Dr. much. Will you also add, don't try this at home? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a waste. Well, that's a waste, um, a waste <laughs> comment there, Dr. Henry. <laughs> uh, but we, we like the enthusiasm. However, yes, we would we would definitely err on the side of caution uh, when when conducting such such um, such activities. I'll take one more question um, because uh, in interest of time and was to wrap up. I just want to field one last question. Um, and I think this is in stream with what the first question was. Um, this is for biogas panelists. Are you running cars on compressed biogas or purified compressed natural gas? The energy cost of the removal of CO2 and carbon, I'm, I'm sorry, hydrogen sulfide from biogas is high. In addition, Hydrogen sulfide is very corrosive to internal combustion engines. How is Barbados doing this? And I guess this is a question for both um, doctors, Henry and Holder. Okay, so I just want to say the we haven't started so we everything is experimental now, but it's, we're not inventing something new though. So biogas, there's buses and cars all over Ireland running on biogas from grasses that they grow specifically for biofuel. So this is not a new technology we're inventing. Um, we are going to figure out the, the exact steps of the process for sargassum with the local um, rum distillery waste and the local industrial wastes. And for, I imagine that Nikolai will agree with this, that for every set of substrates, you'll have different amounts of purification and upgrading of the gas. Um, but we're not inventing a new technology. We're using something that has been implemented in parts of Europe and Asia. And we're just saying we want to implement it in our locality with our feedstocks and solve a problem of um, the sargassum seaweed being everywhere and too much. Um, but it's not a new technology that we have to invent. How do you take out the hydrogen sulfide? How do you do it? We're just going to implement what's been implemented everywhere else. But to the extent that our um, our substrates require. And yes, that's part, part of this 100 car experiment I describe is to understand what is the energy input for upgrading of the gas for that number of cars and, and the cost and how can that be made sustainable to, to all questions we want to answer before we go larger scale. That makes sense and um, thank you very much for your questions. At this time unfortunately we won't be able to get to all of the questions. What we can do, we can forward the relevant questions that you've posted to the panelists and have them um, answer them at their convenience and then share them with the persons who have posted. Um, so I really want to thank all of you, Deputy Principal, um, Professor Moore, and uh, Drs. Holder and Henry and Mrs. 
Coffee Young, I really want to thank you for bringing your expertise, your knowledge, your um, understanding of the issues surrounding waste and also the conversion of waste to, to um, economically viable products um, to this particular seminar. This will be the first installment of the initiative. There will be more to come. Um, so I encourage all of you who are still um, on the call to look out for more webinars coming uh, from the center in, in this regard. So thank you very much for your support. And for all of you who have stayed until the end, we thank you and we salute you as well. And now I turn over the rest of the proceedings for closure uh, to Ms. Christiane Walker. Over to you, Christiane. Thank you, Director. And ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the panel, we thank you once again for your robust engagement throughout this session, as the Director has just said, for posting comments, questions, and staying the course with us and remaining engaged and online. We do value and appreciate your time. In the event that any of you may still be pondering the material presented or you'd like to take back some of this information to your respective teams, as we saw one or two people indicate that they would like to do, uh, before you engage further with us, we would welcome this and we very much look forward to following up with you uh, offline wherever this is possible. So please do send us any follow-up emails to biosecurity at cavehill.uwy.edu. That's biosecurity at cavehill.uwy.edu. And as we bring today's session to a close, and in addition to the director's thanks that he expressed to our Featured panelists, I also extend special thanks to Mr. Samuel Eugene and Mr. Jamal Innes of Campus IT Services. And of course, our very own Mr. Wesley Moore of the Center for Biosecurity Studies, who provided the backstage technical support for today's production, and without whom these events would really not be possible. Additionally, we extend thanks to the Cave Hill Office of Marketing and Communications for the role that they continue to play in helping us to advertise these events. And to stay connected with the Center for Biosecurity Studies, you're welcome, of course, to respond to any of our circulars that um, yeah, I'm sure many of you would have received these uh, by now, certainly over the course of the past week. Again, send us an email to biosecurity at cavehill.uwy.edu. And we also invite you to peruse our website at www.cavehill.uwy.edu forward slash biosecurity to follow all of our upcoming activities or to review anything that you might have missed. We also welcome editorial contributions to our newsletter and there's currently an open call for submissions with an updated deadline of June 15th for our next publication. And that next edition will focus on climate change, air pollution and the bioeconomy in the Caribbean. So be sure to get your content to us as soon as possible. On behalf of the team here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies, we thank you for joining us today. This session is now adjourned. Thank you.